good. Now, I do just want to let Mike Grover know. Hello, boy. Because he was asking about this leopard. Mike, Mike for Taylor. But it looks like it's Tingana, just from the size of him. Uh, Mike Grover, for Taylor, if you copy, I uh, managed to locate Tingana. He's on that road that runs parallel with Gary Main and Chitwe. It runs on the eastern side of the dam. Sorry, bad luck. Just letting him know because Mike was the one who was helping us search for Tingana and I was really hoping we were going to get it on a spot uh, where he could also come and have a look but unfortunately he cannot. Now I am going to have to call the sighting in too. Let me see if I can if I can uh, call anybody in. Actually I, no, I don't have any signal for the moment so we'll just leave it for a couple of minutes. I'll have to maybe move a bit closer to the lodge and to higher ground. Now of course it's this lovely leopard and I'm going to put a light on him so please excuse me if you see the car moving slightly I'm just going to put one of my LEDs over there. Well spotted also a sensor and let's turn that one on. There we go just creating a little bit of warm light if you will. Isn't this very cool? I'm going to roll forward if we can. Should we see if we can get a we get a better angle, you can stay like that. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to move slightly and see if we can find a better gap through the grass. How's that one? Can we see his eyes a bit better? I'm going to keep going like this just until we find the most perfect gap. I think if I go a little bit further forward, there we go. Hang on, almost. Almost! Yay! I have had leopards today, well a leopard. I have had elephants. It has been absolutely wonderful out here. Megan, I'm just confirming, am I still live? Because I haven't heard anything and I know Wendy's signal out here is not the greatest. Fantastic. I am so happy. I was worried for a minute. Megan was very quiet. It must be because she's so excited to see so many leopards today. And uh, I thought for a moment that I was perhaps just talking to myself. But I'm glad that I'm not talking to myself. I'm glad that I'm talking to all of you. And, well, thanks to those squirrels. Thank you, Tingana, for giving a rasping call that we were all able to hear. And luckily for us, we managed to find his tracks too, which was great. So all of those things together... Wonderful. What a wonderful combination in being able to find that leopard. So that's it. Being at the right place at the right time or being close enough to the right place to follow up on a cat like this. Now I just want to try and call the sighting in very quickly. Can any stations copy me? I don't think I've got good signal here. Ellie! I've located Mokulumodora Ingwe. He is, I'm not sure what the name of the road is, the road that runs parallel to Gauri Main on Chitwa. Uh, we're basically about 300 meters north of the lodge. I've got visual of the lodge. Um, I don't have very good comms though, it's just myself here. Space for two. I'm east of the open area. Uh, I can see the setup, but uh, he's basically uh, just on that road that runs on the eastern side of the lodge in parallel to Gari Main. I'm quite close to the lodge. He's static for the moment. Cool. So we actually he's just speaking to Ellie, in case you were wondering. You might be able to hear the hippos calling in the distance too. Copy, thanks, Ali. Um, I'm going to go radio down just for a little bit of... I don't have good comms. If anybody wants to come and join me, they're more than welcome. There's space for two. There we go. So we, It's very, very hard to try and chat to the other guys. It's just a bit scraggly, the radio, at the moment. So at least we've notified Ali because she's driving at Chitwa at the moment. I think she's having a sundowner currently, which is actually not too far from here. And wouldn't that be a fantastic way, or well, a fantastic way to end your day with a big male leopard strolling past while you're having a sundowner in the bush. And I can tell you that that's happened to all of us as guides. It's the most amazing thing to experience, a big male leopard walking past you on foot. Now, we have had experiences before. In Tangana, of course, doesn't... Uh, like people on foot but that's of course when you're tracking um, however I think that he'll be okay this time because you'll hear all the noise you'll just watch from a distance and carry on 
but there's also some zebra and impala not too far from him, about 100 meters away. And I reckon that's going to be his next position. If you just look just all the way down over there, you can see the lodge, you see bits and pieces of the lodge, and then of course the impala, an entire whole herd, a whole herd of impala, and a couple of zebra too. What we're going to do, we're going to send you across to James now. The light is starting to fade, and we'll be back with you in a moment. It is indeed getting to dark. Getting to dark? It is getting to dark. And if young Wood Tommy decides to hunt again in the past, we would have had to sit in darkness and just listen to his efforts. However, this time around, we don't have to worry because, of course, we've got our infrared all set up. But for now, this is perfectly okay to sit with him. But as it does start to get darker, then we will switch to the infrared I still can't get over. I love those moments of discovery in the bush. It's somehow not more fun. It's just fun in a different kind of way when we get to share finding the animal with you. Because a lot of the time we've tracked them. We've it's it's not as frequent that we stumble upon the animal while we're with you, and that that to me is a wonderful thing to share. And you get to share in our excitement. Isn't this the second time with Wutomi this has happened in a week? I'm sure it happened with James not too long ago as well. Now, Domza, you want to know what is the leopard's main threat animal-wise? A lion would probably be the biggest threat to a leopard. But we so frequently see, and I'm wondering if I shouldn't go back just ever so slightly. Mm. Let's just get that branch out of his face. We frequently see leopards, once they're at a certain age, often lying very close to hyenas without being too bothered by their presence. Mm. Here we go. It's a pleasure, Seb. Anything. Anytime. What was I? Oh yes, so, and lions are really the cat that is capable of doing the most damage to them. Lions and wild dogs. And both of those species, like all predators, will target and try and catch other predators if they can. Now wild dogs and leopards, baboons can be an enormous threat for cubs, as can hyenas and other such creatures, even unknown male leopards. And in fact, Nomadic male leopards are probably responsible for more leopard cub deaths than any other predator. However, man, of course, sits right up there above everything else, as we always do, unfortunately. Combination of habitat loss, poaching, hunting, particularly on farms. Not all farms, obviously. There are some very environmentally conscious farmers. So I'm definitely not going to put them all into one box. But in situations where there is a farmer that doesn't want a leopard eating his livestock, unfortunately what often happens is that leopard doesn't survive. So mankind hands down the biggest killers of leopards. However, luckily for us, the leopards that we see are completely protected. Liz, that's an interesting question. I'm talking about the movements of leopards, and of course you've been with that big dominant male, Tingana. Uh, Liz, you want to know, do we find that the dominant males patrol less? Which of course is something that Futomi isn't going to be doing anytime soon. But if they patrol less during winter, because there's less rain, so there's less chance of their scent marking being washed away. I suppose there is something to that. It's a good point because we always talk about how after the fact that it's after it's rained, it's perfect big cat weather because they all come out to re-scent mark. However, I think there's a, a far larger circumstantial factor as well. At the moment, Tingana is patrolling more than I've ever known him to patrol. He is moving constantly. It seems like he's moving in constant clockwise circles through his territory. Onto Arethusa, through Simbambili, onto Juma, onto Juma's northern cut line, back into Torchwood and down south onto Cheetah Plains, rinse and repeat. And he's been doing that, he's always been a leopard that walks a lot, but to me, 
he is particularly focused right now. I don't know why that would be. I don't know if it's pressure from another male. I don't know if there's young up-and-coming males that have been wandering about that perhaps have made him feel threatened. I don't know if it's perhaps, dare I say, the lack of female attention. There's his broken canine on the bottom left. Or there's the lack of broke lack of canine on the bottom left. You get a chance to see it nicely. I don't, I, I, that sounds ridiculous, but I mean, Tingana hasn't had a female to mate with in a long time. Kirk, you say, is he still eating that terrapin? He is still eating this terrapin. Seems a lot of effort, doesn't it, for what must be a relatively poor and really not nice tasting meal, especially when it comes with the risk of breaking teeth. You can see that he's got in though, and it's hard. It's not an easy thing for for a leopard to get into, and it really is taking him a very long time. So hopefully he has been supplementing his diet. I've I've heard. I've just remembered this. I've heard he's killed an impala before, a baby impala. So he is capable. Bobby, watching our poor leopard struggle with his terrapin dinner, you want to know. How many terrapins does it take to make a full meal for this leopard? I I can guess and say for a nice full belly it would take more than he would actually go to the trouble of catching. I would say if a leopard of his size is probably capable of eating, let's say, a half a dacre in one sitting. That's, a, that's quite a high estimate, but let's put it at that. So let's put it at around about, give or take, 8 kilograms. Terrapin only weighs a couple of hundred grams, the little ones that he's capable of getting into. So really, you're looking at, I don't know, 20, 30, 40 terrapins? I'm not doing the math right now. It's a lot. But they are enough to sustain him and give him the energy that he needs. He's heard something. One thing I want to be very careful about is making sure that if there is a herd of antelope coming to the water, that we don't give Tommy's position away. I really don't want to do that. He's perfectly hidden now. I can hear something drinking. Keep the spotlight on him. No, whatever it is, it's not of interest to him, and therefore not too much of a worry from us. And Meg, sorry, can I have that name one more time? I just definitely don't want to get it wrong. <laughs> Gibby! Gibby, who is six years old. Hello, Gibby. And welcome, it's lovely to have you. I misheard your name initially. Gibby, you want to know if we will intervene if he were to lose both of his canines. So in other words, would we help him? It depends on how he's lost his canines. It would be very, very difficult for us to actually be able to put implants in or anything like that. So it would be really difficult. If he lost his teeth because of people, then yes, we would definitely help him. But if he lost his teeth by eating terrapins, then no, we wouldn't. But remember that a leopard doesn't just rely on its canine teeth. It also relies on, relies on their claws, the power of their jaw, their front teeth, their back teeth. So even if he did lose his canines, there's still a chance that he would be able to be well-fed and survive absolutely healthily. I knew a caracal once with no canines. And she was fine, and still equally terrifying. So it does happen. Leopards lose teeth. I also knew a, a leopard known as Shilaweni. Shilaweni was caught in a, a trap, which was a, a big metal cage, not a not a trap like a gin trap, a, a metal cage. And he was so angry and upset. He was being transported, I think, off a farm. I don't know his full backstory. I think he was being transported off a farm and re was going to be released elsewhere. And Shilaweni ended up ultimately pulling out all four of his canine teeth in the course of the night. 
and they ultimately really did look up look up as at ways of putting one of the thoughts they had was titanium implants to replace his canine teeth eventually it was decided it was going to be a hugely traumatic process and he unfortunately lived the rest of his life in captivity but such things do happen oh wow that's very beautiful seems an appropriate way to spend an evening does it not such a pity he's found himself in such an awkward position because I was certain he was going to go hunting again and hi to Mia Mia welcome to the sunset safari it has been a wonderful evening so far Mia you want to know at what age do leopards typically leave their mothers on average remember every individual is different just like every human being is different you're usually looking at the females becoming independent slightly sooner, maybe about a year and a half, sometimes a bit later. And the males, because remember, the males are going to have a far tougher time of things in terms of having to dodge other dominant males in an area. So they will usually leave it around two or so years old. Sometimes they hang around even longer than that. The average, based on scientific research, the average gap between litters is 25 months and obviously once a female leopard has a new set of cubs then she will immediately become invested in that set of cubs and generally speaking any offspring that we're planning on hanging around get the idea and off they go so the average is 25 months between litters that's basically two years and then it's time to be on your way so at 18 months ish not quite I don't think surely he can't be as old as that is that really how time has flown he looks so small he's still a little bit a little bit young still shame having to use those sharp spurs on his teeth on his tongue to scrape away at the shell. Welcome to Anne in Maryland. And there's quite a few new names here, which is lovely to hear. Uh, new viewers, I believe. It's lovely to have you. And thank you for send sending through your question, Anne. You want to know if our leopards will stay here during winter or if they migrate. And leopards don't migrate. They are strictly territorial and those territories will stay relatively fixed. So they don't migrate according to whether it's winter or summer. They don't, they're not like herds of wildebeest or something like that. These animals will constantly have access to antelope because most antelope don't migrate. Most antelope will be around. So their primary source of food will be here all year round. So as nice as it would be to think that perhaps Karula is wintering in somewhere to the south of us, they don't migrate at all. Their territories will change over time and their territories are fluid, so it's not a set box that they live in. Their territories will change and certainly there might be a little bit of a degree of movement depending on, let's say, there's more water in one part of their territory at a certain time of year. The food might be a bit better there, so they'll spend more time there. But other than that, it's, that's not what we would describe as a migration. And in fact, nothing really out here migrates in the official way, that they, apart from birds. Birds and bats are the things that migrate out here. Even our antelope don't follow the same seasonal movements that they might somewhere like in East Africa. Luckily for us, otherwise imagine, how would we do our live safaris if they all migrated? Our oh, Kirk, you want to know whether or not I could perhaps explain to you the 3-4 spot pattern? Yes, with pleasure. However, can I insert a disclaimer here? 
I find uh, the spot patterns are the official way to do things and they absolutely have their place in terms of research. I personally find that I like to look for markers in the leopard in their spots, unique patterns, stuff that I can remember. And you find that I personally find that easier. However, the official research way that these animals are recorded and the way in which they kept a record of is to look at the top row of spots above the whiskers. And of course, this is going to be very, very difficult for us to do here. And if I'd had any common sense, I would have got the pictures that Brent usually used to demonstrate from him before he left. But it's too late for that now, unfortunately. But the top row of spots there, he might give you a view. There you go. You can just count them. It's very difficult when he's eating a terrapin. So you count the top row of spots above the whiskers and you count the number of spots there. You start on the right and then you work your way to the left and that will give you the spot pattern. And each and every single leopard has either one, two, three or four or five even spots on one side and then a number of spots on the other side. And obviously that gives you a wide range because a leopard could be a four four, it could be a, a two four, it could be a two three, whatever it happens to be. But bear in mind that there's a limited number of those combinations and that sometimes leopards will have the same spot pattern. And then in that case it's about territories, it's about other defining features, a missing tooth would be a good example, a missing lower left canine to distinguish Futomi from an, another leopard with the same spot pattern, a notch in the ear, a scar, although you've got to be careful with scars because scars heal and disappear as time marches on or change. But those are the sorts of things that research, researchers will look to look for. You hear that? I do hear that. What is that? bird of some sort. What on earth is that? I'm just going to take my spotlight off for Tommy for now. I have absolutely no idea what that bird call was. Oh, an owl or... I'm, I'm thinking owl as well, but it's not an owl I've ever heard out here. I'm totally bemused. Totally, totally. Oh, I can't even do it now. Oh. Oh. Stopped. As soon as I put my spotlight out. Hmm. Confused. Very, very confused. Apologies for getting distracted by the leopard from the leopard. I just don't know that sound. I might have to go and do some research and some asking around. Apparently a lot of you are saying to get back to the subject at hand, or on face, as it happens to be, apparently a lot of you are saying that the best way that you tell the different leopards apart is their spot pattern around their eyes, identifying marks around the eyes. I'm with you on that. I look at the eyes. Just in general, I look at the eyes. I find that each and every leopard has unique, completely unique eyes. May soon be time for us to switch to infrared, however Taylor has beaten us to it. Let's go and see what Tingana looks like in black and white. You can see he has got up and inched his way closer and closer to where the impala are and I can actually just start to see a couple of them. He's gone from being about 100 meters away from them to about 60 meters, 70 meters away from them so he's getting closer. Now, I got a little bit worried about him earlier because he stepped out onto the road slightly and I thought, oof, Tangana, that's a bit silly. 
because if he steps too far out on the road, he would have exposed himself. But I was the silly one in that situation. He was actually using the curvature, the bend in the road to his advantage. And he was still hidden behind the grass. So he moved well away from the road. He's now putting a bit of vegetation, sort of some small shrubs between him. And hopefully he's going to continue going south. Because there he'll find himself some impala. How cool is this? We are so, so, so lucky to have infrared. It really does make all the distance uh, difference. Sorry, oh my goodness. We are sitting in complete darkness at the moment. I can just see his shadow sort of moving through the grass. And I think he's found himself a target. There's an entire herd of impala, like I said. There must have been about 50 of them. But there's lots of young rams that shouldn't be around the breeding herd at the moment. And they, hang they were. Well, this is when it was light that I could see it. There were a lot of them hanging towards the outskirts, which is super exciting. Because like I was telling you all yesterday, is they are sort of very... Um, confused at the moment as to why they are being told to leave the the herd, and they're also watching their back, and they've been separated. So every now and then they're on their own too. We're going to give him a little bit of room now, so we'll just watch him as he takes up his next position. And once he's stopped, then we'll start to move as well. I don't want to, of course, give the impala, um, you know, an opportunity to spot him. Well, I do want the impala to have an opportunity to spot him naturally and by naturally I mean I don't want to muffle the sound there we go there's an alarm call right let's get going that was really funny as as we basically s Ooh. oh hang on I will tell you in a moment so what happened there was quite funny actually as that impala alarmed straight away Almost instantly it responded. Now I've got my spotlight out. I'm going to just try and find him again. It's like he went, okay, well, I've been spotted now. What is the point? You can see the zebras. I can't see Tingana. Went. Right, let's see if we can find this electric. Long, it's so hard. Right, we're going to go across to Jamie Nartingana's marking his territory. We just need to find a bit of better signal.